Hello, fellow fiends! Welcome to the season five premiere of Creepy Cases and Spooky Spaces. I am your host, Cassie Opea. I am so excited to be back and to be creating content, researching, and getting everything set up for the season ahead. And I hope you're just as excited to be back and watching or listening. Um, and I hope that you enjoy all of the content I have coming your way. So let's get all that fun stuff out of the way. Um, you can catch me every Friday. Those are the new episodes. And if you subscribe to the Patreon and or the Anchor, um, which you can do for as little as $5 a month, you actually get bonus episodes throughout the month. You get early access to the Friday episodes. Um, you get a mention, a thank you. You also get a 10% merchandise code, which is actually good for anything in the Wiccan Fae store on the Pizza and Pigtails website. So you can use it on um, the Creepy Cases merchandise, any of that, the t-shirts, the cups, the notebooks. Um, you can use it on the candles. Um, and actually, I'm wearing my I Heart Creepy Cases, and I actually really love this shirt. Um, you also get a welcome uh, with the Patreon. You get a welcome thank you swag box. Um, and so that's actually kind of exciting too. Um, if you would like to support without subscribing, um, your basic uh, liking, sharing, commenting, following on social media, subscribing to the YouTube channel, um, subscribing to all of the different podcasts, um, whichever one you use, the different platforms, um, buying merch, um, I mean, I also have a Cash App and a Venmo set up, and I'll go ahead and throw that information up on the screen if you'd like to throw a dollar, two dollars, anything honestly really helps um, keep the podcast going, and I definitely appreciate all of the support. Um, you can also get the Wick and Fade candles. Don't forget we have a Creepy Cases and Spooky Spaces line, and I might actually be um, adding to those scents here soon, those fragrances soon. Um, I've had uh, quite a few little ideas to kind of add on to Creepy Cases and Spooky Spaces. Um, also, if you are a business owner or if you're a content creator or anything like that and you're looking for a way to kind of get your name out there, um, I also offer very budget-friendly packages for ad space on the podcast here. Um, so you can get more information about that. Um, I can send you all of it. Uh, if you just send me an email at creepycases.spookyspaces at gmail.com. So uh, let's get into today's episode. So grab your coffee, your tea, your beer, your wine, whatever you want to sit and relax with while I tell you a little story. Now, I'm sure we all know the story of the Amityville House, or better known as the Amityville Horror House. Now, it's a terrifying tale of demonic possession that still fascinates the world uh, more than four decades later. Now, I'm going to take you back to December 1975, when 29-year-old George Lutz and his 30-year-old wife, Kathy, along with their three children, move into their dream home on the quiet street of Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York. Now, they couldn't believe their luck when they nabbed the 4,000 square foot, six bedroom colonial style home for just $80,000. I can't believe their luck because I would love a 4,000 square foot, six bedroom colonial style home for $80,000. Now, only a mere 28 days later, they were fleeing for their lives and their story has actually been published as a book in 1977, and it has spawned 16 films loosely and closely based on their experience. So what happened in the home to make an entire family just up and leave? And I mean, they left all of their stuff and they refused to return. But what happened that turned the home 
that was in a place where you didn't lock your doors to a place of how did that happen? Now, the story is widely thought to be a hoax, and some people have actually come forward, even the lawyer who claims that he made it up and admitted that they were all lying. Um, But others have stated that it really happened, even the children who lived in the home at the time. And some of them say that maybe some of the events or details have been embellished, but I'll let you be the judge of that. So let's get started on this spooky space of the Amityville Horror House. So George and Kathy Lutz married in July of 1975. And George became the stepfather of her three children. Now, at this time, each one of them had their own house, but they wanted to start their new life together in their own home. Now, after looking at almost 50 properties, they found their dream home in the three-story, six-bedroom, colonial style, named High Hopes, complete with a swimming pool, a boathouse, and a canal location, which... I um, have seen the homes that are right on the canal and you basically just take your boat out onto the water and it's just, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's amazing. I'm so jealous. <laughs> now, all of the furniture had actually been left in the home from the family before. And so they thought that this was an absolute steal. And honestly, in my opinion, it, it, it was. But among their initial walkthrough of the house, the realtor told them of the history and asked if this would affect their decision to buy. Now, after talking it over for a little bit, they decided that no, it wouldn't be an issue and that they would stick to buying the home because they just couldn't believe their luck. That is until the incidents began. Now, with any good tale, Um, especially those based on true events, it gets retold time and time again. So you're going to have some details changing here and there. You can almost count on it. Now, due to the home's history, one of George's friends suggested that they should have it blessed by a Catholic priest. Now, unfamiliar with this process, George and Kathy reached out to the local church And George explains in a 2005 interview, Father Ray showed up on December 16th while they were moving in um, to bless the home. He said that they basically just waved hello to each other and Father Ray made his way into the house while George went back to unpack. When he was done, George offered him payment, but Father Ray refused. Um, But he did mention that he felt something a little strange in one of the bedrooms upstairs and told George, "Mm, maybe not let anyone sleep in there. George explained it was going to be used as a sewing room, so it shouldn't be an issue, right? Right, well, the Lutz family was wrong in believing that as well. Now, some of the source material claims that Father Ray didn't actually tell George about his experience or what he um, encountered, but this also depends on what you read or watch. And some of the things that he actually had happened to him upstairs was he was slapped in the face um, by unseen hands. (laughs) Uh, he, He heard a voice telling him to get out. And there was actually a time where there were flies that were getting in the, in, the, in the room with him, but there was nowhere that they would really be coming from. Now, strange things began to happen to the family pretty much right away. Uh, the family began experiencing cold spots throughout the home. Um, but, you know, it's just an older house, right? It, there's cold spots everywhere. Um, the feeling of being watched or followed through the house. Um, now that's not as common as cold spots in old homes, but you know, it's a new place. You're kind of excited, but nervous at the same time. Now, 
when the cabinets started opening and closing on their own, maybe with the door slamming, hinges creaking as if someone's playing with the doors, other unexplained loud noises that would wake the family up in the middle of the night, they kind of started to question what, what was going on. Now, odors would come and go, and drops of a sort of gelatinous goo would ooze from the walls or appear in the carpet. Now, another discrepancy in the stories um, that I found in my research is the color of the goo would actually vary. Sometimes it was red, um, it would be green in some stories, and it would be black in other stories. And some say that this kind of happened because the goo would actually be different colors itself. But I can't really confirm nor deny that as I just went by what I was researching myself. Now, all of these all of these events actually took a toll on the entire family, and it caused drastic personality changes in all of them. The children would argue and fight when they never really did that before, other than the occasional sibling spat, but this would actually cause tempers to flare between George and Kathy, and it would result in some harsh punishments. Now, Missy, the youngest child, said that she had been talking to an angel named Jody whom she claimed was living in her bedroom. She had told Kathy that Jody could actually present himself as a large pig and could also change shape or form at will. Now, both George and Kathy had actually explained that they saw red glowing eyes staring in at them from an upstairs bedroom window, and Missy told them that it was Jody trying to get inside. Now, my thing is, if I'm upstairs on a second floor and, or I mean, on any floor, and there are red eyes staring in at me, I'm going to start getting a little faster with getting out of the home to begin with. Hmm. Now, they actually came across a room in the basement that had been closed off, and Kathy said that she felt that it felt evil. And which is probably why it had been closed off. Um, But so they tried to have the home blessed again. And when that didn't seem to stop the strange happenings, they ended up trying to do it themselves, which I'm sure you can imagine didn't go well. And things actually got worse. Uh, Kathy has talked about being touched by unseen hands. And so did Father Ray. Um, She claims that after waking up from a deep sleep, her face had actually been morphed into an old hag, and it actually took hours to return to normal. And the night before they left the home, Kathy actually levitated and was pulled off the bed. Now, while everyone in the home was affected, it seemed that George was the one that kind of took the brunt of whatever was going on. And he even became obsessed with the occult due to this. He began to seclude himself from his family, and he would begin waking up at 3.15 every morning. And he claims that he was obsessed over the fireplace, and no matter what he did, he just could not get warm enough. He never wanted to leave the house, so they would invite people over, and these guests would actually involve, involve, they would actually witness the things going on as well. So I don't know how you have so many people claiming that they witnessed sounds or saw things that that were unexplainable. Now, George became more emotional as the days went on, and he basically went from a very laid-back, kind of reserved, um, easygoing type to a short-tempered, kind of loud, and not-so-nice personality. He described the events of the final night that they were in the room, or in the home, and the reason that they left. Now, George says that he was lying in bed, everyone else was asleep. And he said that Kathy then lifted off of the bed and just slid away. Now he says that he tried to reach out and kind of grab a hold of her, thinking that maybe she rolled off the bed, 
um, or something like that. But he felt something actually get in the bed with him and was unable to move. So he couldn't actually reach out to her. He claims that they could hear the children's beds slamming up and down and being dragged across the floor upstairs. And they also heard what sounded like pigeons on the air conditioner above their bedroom. But upon inspection, um, there was no evidence of anything being up there. Now the lights were flickering and the dog who was in the room was just walking in circles and throwing up all night. The next morning, the boys were absolutely terrified. They told George and Kathy that they were unable to move or get out of their beds and their bedroom. Kathy couldn't even remember most of the night. So on January 14th, 1976, the Lutz family fled and never to return. They actually refused to go back to the house at all. Now, after leaving the home, the Lutzes contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren. And if you follow the paranormal world, I'm, or if you've seen any of the Conjuring films, I'm sure that those names are most likely very familiar to you. <laughs> However, if you don't, Ed and Lorraine Warren are, well, they were, they both uh, since passed away, but they were a married couple who actually traveled the world performing all kinds of paranormal investigations, exorcisms, seances, um, and I'm, I'm sure you get the idea of, <laughs> of um, what they did. Now, in February, they actually visited the Amityville home, and Lorraine described the atmosphere as an overwhelming sense of sadness and depression, and this went throughout the entire structure. Now, Ed said that he felt a powerful, inhuman presence in the basement, but he explained it as if he was standing under a waterfall with the pressure just pushing him down into the floor. Now, in March, the Warrens actually returned with a team to perform a seance to kind of see what was going on in the home. Now, one attendee, Mary Pascarella, began to say the Our Father prayer, and she claims that she saw a group of figures outside who were saying the prayer, but they were saying it backwards. And she also became so violently ill that she had to leave the room. Now, Channel 5 cameraman Steve Metropolis was there in this group, and he experienced heart palpitations and a shortness of breath while going up the stairs. And they also say there was a cold spot in that area while this was going on. Alberta Riley said whatever was in the house was upstairs in the one bedroom, and it was very negative, but it wasn't connected to anyone who had been in the home. Now, George and Kathy, like I said, refused to return to the home. They didn't want any of their stuff. They didn't want to go back for anything. Then they wouldn't even actually go back when Ed and Lorraine did their, um, did their walkthrough or their seance and everything. So they went to stay with Kathy's parents, where they actually experienced a few things there as well. Nothing as horrifying as what they went through at High Hopes, but once again, doors slamming, loud noises... Um, I don't think there was any goo or um, any touching or being anything like that. Um, so what do we think um, happened? Now, let's revisit, though, the first time that the Lutzes toured the Amityville home. What exactly did the realtor share with them about the history of the house that the realtor thought would cause them to change their minds on even purchasing the home. Now, I'm sure most of you listening and or if you're watching on YouTube, um, you probably know the history of the Amityville home. Um, But for those who don't, let me tell you the grisly story. Now, let me take you back to November 13th, 1974, when 23-year-old Ronald DeFeo Jr. murdered his entire family. And when I say his entire family, this includes his parents and his four younger siblings. And less than 24 hours later, he ran into a local bar crying to the patrons for help. 
Now, the DeFeos were a family of seven who had moved into the home in 1965. Ronald Sr., his wife Louise, and their five children, Ronald Jr., Don, Allison, Mark, and John. Now, originally from Brooklyn, they had moved into the home, dubbing it High Hopes, as it stated that's what they had had for their future. Now, it was known that there was quite a bit of turmoil in this family. Ron Sr. was verbally and physically abusive towards his family, mainly his eldest son, Ronald, who went by Butch. Now, Ronald's temper was so bad that the kid's friends were scared to even go to the house as they had witnessed him yelling and even hitting members of the family. Now, Butch um, was bullied at school, and Ronald encouraged him to stand up and fight back. And as Butch got older, his temper started to grow worse and worse, and it even surpassed his father's. Now, he was sent to a psychiatrist, but this didn't help. So his parents basically gave up and began giving him whatever he wanted. And this didn't really help anything because you go from basically one extreme to the other. And that's just, and then you kind of become an enabler. And let me tell you, it does not go well. So they still have their blow out violent fights, and even though Ron would shower Butch with money and all of the material items he wanted, it just, it just kept, that bubble just kept growing and growing. He was kicked out of Amityville High School at 17 years old when he began using LSD and heroin, and he became very unpredictable and actually pointed a gun at a childhood friend during a camping trip. And he later claimed that he was just joking. Um, However, I'm sorry, but anybody who wants to point a gun at me, whether you're just joking, um, you can uh, flip right off, uh, for lack of a better term. Now, at 18, he actually began working for his father and was paid whether or not he showed up to work. So he took full advantage of working for the family. Now, a server at a nearby eatery said that Butch was a really nice guy, and he was actually rather quiet until he began drinking, which then he would get into bar fights, throw bar stools around, and even the pool cues. His girlfriend at the time of the murders, Sherry, said that there was a time at her place when Butch and some friends were getting a little rowdy, and when she tried to calm them down, he threw her across the room, and she actually climbed out a window and went to her parents' house to get away from him. Now, on November 13th, Butch left for work, just like any other day, but he stopped to eat while he was waiting for the dealership to open. He left work early to meet up with his girlfriend, Sherry, and his friend, Bobby. And he had kind of mentioned to them that throughout the day, he was trying to call um, home to talk to his parents, but he couldn't get through. And he even called the house in front of Sherry, and there was no answer. Now, at 6 p.m., he called the home again from Henry's bar, but no answer. So he said that he was a little worried and that he was going to head home and he'll just break in through a window. Which this strikes me as odd because if you live there, you should have a key. Um, But, like, why would you have to break in? Like, okay, I guess if maybe you forgot your key, maybe that's why you were trying to get a hold of your parents. Just let them know, like, hey, forgot my key, can't get in. Something like that. But at around 6.30 p.m., he returned to the home, or the bar. He returned to the bar calling out for help and that his parents had been shot. Now, a group of friends left the bar with him and went to the house and found the entire family, not just the parents, dead. Shot with a 35 caliber Marlin rifle. Now, all of them were in their beds as though they were sleeping. So Joseph Jesuit called police. Now, Ronald Sr. and Louise were both shot twice in the lower back and chest, both face down on the bed. 12-year-old Mark and 9-year-old John were also shot in the back, but this was at close range. 13-year-old Allison was shot once in the face from less than 2 feet away, and 18-year-old Don was shot in the back of the neck 
from two and a half feet away. Now, when questioned by authorities, Butch told them he had stayed home from work the day before with a stomach bug, and he had watched Castle Keep and fell asleep around 2 a.m., waking up around 4 a.m. with stomach pains. So he claimed that he saw his brother Mark's wheelchair outside of the bathroom along with the light being on, and he had heard the toilet flush. But he claims that he felt better um, and was pretty well rested, so he decided to just get up and go to work. It's really odd. It's 4 a.m. that he claims this is all happening. Now, when asked who he thought might have killed his family, Butch claimed that a man by the pseudonym of Louis Fellini. He explained that he was a mafia hitman who he had had an altercation with not too long before the murders. Now, my thing is, I get that, like, I mean, I don't want to say, well, the mafia is known for, because I honestly, you know, only know about the mafia through movies and books and a little bit of, you know, the history that I've read. So I don't know what the mafia is known for. <laughs> um, but I would think that he would come after Butch and not the rest of the family. Or if he was to come after, you know, the family, he would kill all of them and not just the family believe Butch, but I know that some, you know, I've seen in the movies that sometimes it's, well, I'll get back at you by taking the things that you love, but then leaving you to kind of suffer with not having those things, you know? So neighbors told belief that they felt, police, that they felt that Butch could definitely have been the one to commit the murders. Upon searching the home, they actually found the 35 caliber Marlin rifle had been moved. It wasn't with the rest of the firearms. It was in a box with a 22 caliber rifle. Now, after finding this, police focused on Butch, who, who strongly stood by his story that it was Fellini. Now, when asked about his family, Butch didn't seem too upset that they had been murdered and really had nothing nice to say in general. He said his mom was a lousy cook. Um, his brothers were... Um, effing pigs, uh, his sisters were selfish, his dad was a tyrant, um, things like that. Um, but police also found ammo for the murder weapon, and that's when Butch changed his story. It was also found that Butch wasn't at work between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m., but um, when pushed, Butch put his hands to his head and told them to give him a minute. And then that's when he confessed he was the one who murdered his family at 3.15 a.m. that morning, or the morning they were killed. Now, Ronald DeFeo Jr. was arrested right then and there, but his trial began on October 14, 1975, and his defense lawyer, William Weber, went in with a defense of insanity and with DeFeo claiming self-defense because he heard their voices, and by when he says their voices, I assume he means like his father, um, his mother, maybe even his sisters, his brothers were a little young, but um, heard their voices plotting against him. Now, Dr. Harold Zolan, a witness for the prosecution, said, although DeFeo was a drug user and had antisocial personality disorder and possibly could have been hearing voices from the use of alcohol and drugs. Um, he was completely aware of his actions and he knew what he was doing. Now, on November 21st, 1975, Ronald DeFeo Jr. was found guilty on six counts of second degree murder. Six weeks later, on December 4th, Judge Thomas Start sentenced him to six sentences of 25 years to life. And he spent the rest of his life in the Sullivan Correctional Facility in Fallowburg, New York. He died on March 12th, 2021, at age 69. Now, I do have some questions about the DeFeo murders because there are some things that Ronald didn't really um, elaborate on. So they were all face down on their beds. 
Um, there was no noise. Um, no one else woke up in the is uh, out. We'll try that again. <laughs> They were all face down. <laughs> there was no noise. And there was, so no one woke up, like no one heard the gunshots. Um, neighbors actually didn't hear any gunshots coming from the home. And these homes, like you would, I think you would hear um, a rifle being shot, especially if it was shot, they were shot twice between, you know, one and two times, three times each maybe. So that's a lot of shots that nobody at all has heard. The motive, I feel, is unclear because was it money? Was it emotional distress? Um, I know he claims that he heard their, their voices plotting against him, but I don't know, what is it, maybe fear? Uh, maybe something like that. Now, there's varying accounts as well. There's actually a story that was given that Dawn, the oldest daughter, was actually the one who came to DeFeo and said that she wanted to kill their parents, but that she didn't know how to go about doing it, and she asked him to help. Now, there was actually gunpowder on Dawn's nightgown, and so I'm wondering if there's a little bit of truth to that story, um, just because would maybe she have shot somebody um, and then Ronald, I don't know why he would have shot her, but maybe just snapped. Um, he also told pe police that there were evil spirits telling him to do it. Um, the priest did confirm, uh, hearing get out and a slap on his face. I know that's not really part of the DeFeo murders, um, but that's definitely something that I kind of question about, like, just in general of the home, the priest actually confirmed. So if, like, everybody talks about how William Weber claims that it was a hoax and it was made up and he's the one that made it up, but why would a priest actually confess and talk about these things that happened to him if they never really did. Um, the red room in the basement was not actually concealed, um, but they said when they first found it, it had been blocked off and concealed. Um, George Lutz's son, there's actually a documentary um, called My Amityville Horror, and he actually talks about the things that happened to him in the home as a child, and he talks about um, living with George and how his personality changed, and so I definitely would check that out if you want a firsthand um, view of what happened in the home. So there have been no instances reported after the Lutz family moved out of Amityville, um, or high hopes. Um, so I'm wondering if the family could be haunted and not the house. Um, George being obsessed with the occult. And I know that he kind of became obsessed with the occult after moving into the home. But he might have invited something in that would have attached itself to the family. Or even if he got involved in the occult, whatever was in the home may have attached to him through that connection as well. And it could have just followed them around, which could explain why there were experiences at Kathy's parents' house, yet Amityville hasn't had any hauntings after the fact. Um, but tell me your thoughts, because I would love to hear it. I always love hearing um, different takes and opinions. Please be respectful if you leave comments. If you um, are going to be having conversations, please keep it civil no, let's not get mean or anything like that, but definitely leave some comments. Um, tell me if you believe it was a hoax or real and why. Like, do you have any more information? Do you live in the area? Have you researched this yourself? Tell me everything there is to know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so go ahead, state um, if there's something that I actually didn't find in my research that you would like to add in, please do that as well. Um, but on that note, you know what that means and until next crime.
Creepy Cases and Spooky Spaces with Cassiopeia is a Pizza and Pigtails production. All episodes are researched, written, and edited by yours truly. You can find new episodes every Friday with bonus episodes coming out every other Tuesday. You can find the podcast on your favorite listening platform, or now you can find it on YouTube as well. Don't forget to follow along on social media, creepycases.spookyspaces, for all future news updates and maybe some content that you won't find on the podcast. Also, be sure to subscribe so you can get access to bonus content, early access to content, and a couple of little thank you swag. If you'd like to contact me about appearing on a future episode, maybe you would like to suggest your own creepy case or spooky space, or maybe you'd also like to reach out about ad space, you can reach me directly at creepycases.spookyspaces at gmail.com or feel free to reach out through those social media platforms as well. And as always, see you next crime.